And may I approach the bench? I wish you would. Watch this, kid. Welcome to Ms. Mojo. And today, we're counting down our picks for the top 10 musical references in Schmigadoon Season 2. Go ahead. Oh, really? Do I have your permission? Uh-oh. Oh, he's peppery. No, don't piss off the narrator. For this list, we're going back into the woods and over the bridge to revisit the magical hidden town ruled by all things musical theater. What clever Easter eggs gave you that feeling of being alive? Sing out Louise in the comment section. Number 10, Pip Pip Hooray for the intro. If we learned anything from our first trip to Schmigadoon, it's that this town knows how to stage an intro. And season two hooks us all over again with one of the most recognizable openers in musical theater. Leave your fancy degrees and your jobs and your cheese. It's time to change your point of view. Schmiggity too. The white gloved hands of Pippin fame are a direct giveaway. But Titus Burgess's introduction as narrator is also strongly in the vein of Ben Vereen's leading player. And while the costumes more closely align with something like Cabaret, the acrobatic choreography of the dance break recalls Pippin's most recent Broadway revival. Okay. I'm really in this. Yeah, bring it in, pal, please. We start to pick out the influence of several other musicals as our characters are introduced, but from one iconic reference to the next, it's the magic of Pippin that draws us into this new story. Welcome to, welcome to, welcome to Chicago. Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. Number 9, a cast of familiar characters. The season one residents of Schmigadoon were a bingo card of classic musical characters, and season two seems to go in even harder. Some of the new personas are easy to pin down to existing characters. Good luck with getting them to care. Kratz got his foul claws in all of them. All the more reason for my cleaver to dispense justice. I shall call this my justice cleaver. You'd have to be completely unfamiliar with musical theater not to see Sweeney Todd in Chicago's bloodthirsty butcher Dooley Blight. Other characters are hybrids. Aaron Tveit's Topher looks like a certain Godspell savior, but expresses Pippin-like yearnings. What am I supposed to be? Who is this guy called me? When will I see? As Mrs. Codwell, Kristen Chenoweth looks and sounds like she's straight off Fleet Street, but a hatred for the orphans in her care adds strong Miss Hannigan vibes as well. Meanwhile, Kratt has a lot in common with Sweeney Todd's Judge Turpin, but shows shades of other antagonists as well. And I will no longer be alone. Maybe we can kill two birds with one stone. Number 8. Bobby and Billy in Roxy and Val. Here comes Bobby. Oh. Here comes Bobby now. Hello, boys. As that refrain might suggest, Chicago's smooth and shady lawyer in residence is meant to conjure up Chicago's Billy Flynn. Bobby's office even includes a subtle reference, but it's not a one to one comparison. For one thing, Bobby's energy is actually much more similar to that of Billy's client, Roxy Hart. This merging of characters really comes through in Bobby's courtroom appearance. Thank you to the judge and all the members of the jury. I will try to make this brief because I know you're in a hurry. See my client, the defendant, Dr. Joshua Diskinner. He was merely at the club to take his darling wife to dinner. He stumbled on the body of Miss Elsie, the decedent, and you may jump to conclusions, but the fact is that you needn't. The prima facie evidence, so it's an avalanche, will be expressly and indubitably proven circumstantial. We see multiple examples of Roxy's moves coupled with Billy's methods. The scene also nods to Jane Krakowski's real-life Broadway cred. We get roller skates a la Starlight Express and a trapeze that recalls a nine. And though she has yet to appear in a chorus line, Krakowski's showmanship is a perfect match for Val's Dance 10 Looks 3, which is paralleled by the chorus of the song in the scene. Bells and whistles are all you need, plus a comprehensive knowledge of the law. Number 7. Prepare ye for a hairy situation. Good morning, Josh Shine. Fresh juice, beets. Flowers for your hair. My hair? Josh might be lost with his new hippie friends, but we've been on this trip before. 
Topher's tribe welcomes Josh to their home, a setting that wouldn't be out of place in productions of Godspell or Hair. And as they initiate Josh into the group, they naturally build to what is both the center point of their philosophy and the most infamous feature of the latter. So lend an ear. Everyone's got a can make it. I'm sorry, what now? Get back to the way we were born. This is mandatory. Oblivious to Josh's reticence, their enthusiasm plays out in a dance segment reminiscent of Age of Aquarius. When that doesn't move Josh to bear at all, though, the tribe moves on to their other tool of persuasion. Sounds like someone needs a lesson in the power of parables. I assure you I do not. And the value of community. The performance style recreates the devised quality scene in Godspell staging, as well as how polarizing those choices have been for audience members over the years. What'd you think? You really did it! <laughs> so much energy! Number 6. How Sweet It Is the aesthetics of the Crack Club are unmistakably part of a cabaret homage, from the double K name to the phones on the tables. But when the show starts, another Fosse musical grabs the spotlight. Do we shock you? Make you ill at ease? Do we offend your tender sensibilities? What's shocking is how well this number recaptures Hey Big Spender from Sweet Charity down to recreating some very recognizable choreography. Though, as Josh and Melissa's reactions suggest, the material isn't nearly as transgressive as it used to be. What do you think about this? I've got a tattoo. Cool. cool. What do you think about that? I've experienced an orgasm, a female one. Sweet Charity receives another faithful salute later on with the song Talk to Daddy. Not only does the song recall the rhythm of life, but the choreography lifts directly from the rich man's frug down to the styling of the featured dancer. Talk to daddy, talk, talk to daddy, talk to daddy. Number 5. Finding Religion The tribe's penchant for narrating their parables is right out of the Godspell playbook. And, as we mentioned, Topher already bears a striking resemblance to the version of Jesus who appears in that show. But when he's busy romancing Jenny, the tribe is quick to find itself a new savior. He healed alive! It's a miracle! It's definitely not a miracle. Lead us! Tell us what to do! Tell us what to do and we'll do it! What? No, I'm, I'm not that guy. Tell us really. what to do! Tell us what to do! Tell us what to do! Please stop chanting that! With the new regime comes a heavier theme, and the strains of Jesus Christ Superstar. The narrator slips easily into the role of Judas with a song that plays on several recognizable tunes from the show. Can you live up to all that they want you to be? Is that also a rhetorical? Yes! Yes, it is! the number, we see growing resentment from both Jenny and Topher, leading to a confrontation. The Judas-Jesus conflict is clear in the exchange between Josh and Topher, with Aaron today getting to deliver on an iconic high note. Is that supposed to make me feel better? Cause it doesn't. It makes me feel the exact opposite. Okay. Give it a Number four, on the chorus line. A five, six, seven, eight! This music echoes in the ears of musical theater fans everywhere, so it's no wonder that everyone already knows the choreography, except for Melissa. She ought to be way in the back. She ought to be way in the okay, back. This crack club dance audition takes its cues directly from the ultimate audition experience, a chorus line. Not only does it include pieces of the original choreography, but it includes step-out moments for the dancers to tell their personal stories. Of course, this becomes another opportunity for a sly wink at a different show. Dad was in the military. You know, the type with a whistle. He used to force my brothers, sisters, and me to perform for guests at dinner parties. God, I hate it when he did that. So this one night I begged him for a taste of champagne. Melissa is our Cassie, with allusions to the music and the mirror in her confessional, her popping head, and her attempt to replicate Donna McKechnie's dance solo. And no chorus line tribute would be complete without a dramatic headshot pose. Oh, 
Wait, we're doing that. Number three, life is a cabaret in Chicago. As Jenny Banks, Dove Cameron is almost uncanny, effortlessly embodying the energy and mannerisms of Liza Minnelli's Sally Bowles. You must come to see me perform at the club tonight. I have a brand new number and it's gonna be just fabulous. And I'll just die if you don't come. Promise me you're going to come, swear on your lives. Get this girl in a revival production. And if you have any doubts, they'll all be kaput after her solo number. The performance masterfully references mine hair both stylistically and lyrically. We had a fine affair, but please get out of mine hair. My dear, I fear it's clear that we're the books. <laughs> Offstage, cabaret illusions abound at the crack club from visual gags to throwaway lines. It takes multiple viewings to appreciate all the little details so meticulously included. But the best reference is a particularly subtle one. I used to have this girlfriend known as Elsie, with whom I shared four sordid rooms in Chelsea. Only referenced in the lyrics of Cabaret, Chicago features Elsie as a character, albeit a very short-lived one. Jenny's late roommate very clearly did not spend time sitting alone in her room. You have blood on your hands and someone just saw you and this is not the kind of musical I want to be in. Number two, Good Company. Introspective and emotional, Stephen Sondheim's 1970 musical Company never broke into the mainstream the way other musicals referenced this season have, but fans of this show are passionate, and Schmigadoon clearly boasts its share. Oh, don't worry. It's just a celebration of being alive. There are understated references sprinkled throughout the episodes in several lines of dialogue. Even the name of lawyer Bobby Flanagan is a nod to female iterations of Company's main character seen in recent remounts of the show. Here comes Bobby, Bobby, baby. Wow, so, wow, so, wow. But the most overt reference is in Melissa's Crack Club debut. The trio number is clearly inspired by You Could Drive a Person Crazy. All those years that you controlled me. Of all the clever homages to Company, this one is easily the most charming. Though we also enjoy the recurring interjections of a Joanne lookalike. Case the jar. Oh, we'll drink to that. Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. The Devil in the Details. Though not the inspiration for Krat, fans of Patrick Page's Hades Town role won't be able to miss the similarities. Wow, so you own this club. Yeah, it's more of a hobby, really. Hmm. My true passion is power. Hmm. Electricity. They always will be together. This reference goes by so fast it might as well be Grease Lightning. A darker tomorrow. Not a lot of smiles here, but they're not exactly fully dressed anyway of our beautiful cabaret girls in here. Annie, Kate, Molly, Tessie, Pepper, Duffy. Bye bye, Jailbirdie. Blink and you'll miss out on what really happened to the rock star heartthrob of yore. I believe you. And I didn't rob that bank. I believe you. Yeah, and I never touched that girl. I believe you too, Conrad. Of course you do. I believe all of you. An event to bring down the house. Phantom's legacy lives on when a wedding takes an operatic turn. Oh! Uh, seriously? Again? Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, two bad babysitters for the price of one. What if, let's say, I could get rid of some of the orphans and you could get some meat at the same time? What exactly are you suggesting? When Dooley Blight and Mrs. Codwell team up, the worlds of Sweeney Todd and Annie come colliding together in a dark and hilarious turn. Taking a cue from a little priest, Codwell and Dooley run down their potential menu, with the orphans very gamely acting as their props. But do you have mincemeats? Well, since meat is sparse, we got mincemeat instead. Slice right off of his eyes. 
Hardwell, please, there are children present. Not for long. The number then segues into what is unmistakably a riff on Hard Knock Life. Obviously, we can't get behind the, um, execution of this idea, but the gleeful energy of the entire ensemble does make the grisly premise so much more delicious. As an extra cherry on top, we see Promises Promises represented in the last moments. And given the subject matter at hand, Turkey Lurkey Time takes on a very different connotation. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.